Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello, everybody. We're here again today with the brain whisperer, Stephen Campbell. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you so well. Doing better as this whole thing gets settled. Mm. The world That's gets good. settled again. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That, Stephen, we've been talking about how to change your way of thinking mm -hmm. and to accomplish really your goals, getting what you want out of life. Mm -hmm. And and ch it's really about changing ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And so I know we talked about this briefly, but it, it, we, mo we need to motivate ourselves. We need to find motivation to make yeah. a change. Yeah. We need to stay on top of it. Why is it why is it so important to find motivation and, and why is it so hard to do sometimes? Motivation is the bottom of everything and people don't really understand that. So that's why I'm so glad you've given me an opportunity just to point out some psychological objectives about this or some benefits. We have two motivations. One is called restrictive. One is called constructive. Let me illustrate both. If I hold up my palm to your palm, John, and press on your palm, what will you do without even thinking about it? You'll press back. That's what we do. I press on you, you press back. That's restrictive motivation. That's when I say to myself, I've got to lose this weight or else I'll get diabetes and I'll get heart problems and all these other things. That's restrictive. That's when we say, if you don't do this, something horrible is going to happen. It's like pushing on your palm. But here's what your brain does. When you push on your brain, your brain pushes back. When you say, I'd better do this, our brain says, oh, yeah, watch me. I hate being told what to do. And when you tell your brain what to do, it reacts in three different ways, okay? Number one, it procrastinates. So when I say, I've got to do this, I notice that often I get kind of tired. Suddenly I want to take a nap. Suddenly I just lose the energy. I procrastinate. Oh, I'll do it when the kids leave. I'll do it when I pay off these loans. I'll do it when we have the money. I'll do it when the Christmas session is over and I don't have all these leftovers. And we have all of these, all of these ways to procrastinate. So that's the first thing the brain does when you say, you've got to do this. Now, if procrastination doesn't work, the next point that comes in is called creative avoidance. And let me illustrate what creative avoidance is. We have two daughters. They're both grown and have their own families. But when they were teenagers, let's imagine that we're having dinner together. And I say to them, Abby and Sarah, you've got to wash the dishes. And here's what Abby will do, because she's very, very street smart. She will say, oh, Daddy, I love washing dishes, but I have got a homework assignment due tomorrow in my first class at 8 o'clock, and if I spend all my time washing the dishes, I'll get a really bad grade. And I'll say, oh, well, gosh, well, maybe I can wash the dishes. Oh, Daddy, you're so sweet. I love you. Thank you very much. That's called creative avoidance. We think of something else to do. So if procrastination doesn't work, creative avoidance comes in. Now, there's a third one called slovenly work. So now it's Friday night, so Abby can't use her homework assignment uh, excuse. So I say, you've got to wash the dishes. So I hear them go into the kitchen and they're banging around and Mary and I are in the living room reading the paper and Abby and Sarah come out and say, we wash the dishes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And they go to their room. I go in the kitchen to check things, how, how they did. 
they washed the dishes. They didn't touch the pots, pans, and silverware. And I go to them, and I say, what's the deal? And he said, well, Daddy, you asked me to wash the dishes, and we did. You didn't say anything about anything else. That's why often our diets do not work. We minimally follow them, but as soon as we reach that weight, what happens? We get off the program, and we gain all the weight back. So restrictive motivation doesn't work. Here is the one that does. And I'll say this really slowly so you don't miss it. It is called constructive motivation. And constructive motivation says, you know what? I don't have to. I want to. I like what I'm becoming. I love what I am doing. And this is my I idea. And you know what the brain says to that? Oh, wow. That sounds really exciting. Let's do that together. And when I used that motivation, I found out that I was paying off the loans, I was losing the weight, and all sorts of wonderful things happened because I was saying, I don't have to do this. I want to do this. Why? Because I like myself. Now, let me give you some examples of both. I think one of the most, the, the most amazing examples of restricted motivation was prohibition between 1920 and 1933, when America said, you will not drink. And you already know what happened. We're still paying for it today. Didn't work. So restricted motivation sounds great, but your brain hates it. Here's a couple of examples of constructive motivation. I wrote my first book when I was teaching at 3.30 in the morning until 6. It took me an, a year to write the book. It was on computer software. When the book was published, I was so used to waking up at 3.30 that rather than going back to sleep, I would get in the car, put my tennis shoes on because I sleep in my sweats, and run over to some mountain behind our house about a half a mile and run up the mountain. It takes about 40 minutes. It is, and I'm still doing this after, gosh, 20 years, the most valuable time during my day. It is my alone time. It is a time when I get to listen to music, when I get to talk to the Lord, when I think about my day. I love that time running up that mountain. Now, if I woke up and said, I've got to do this, because if I don't, here's what's going to happen. I would be able to think of a thousand reasons to stay in bed. And they would be really good reasons, too. But rather than saying, I've got to, pressing on the palm, I say, you know what? Imagine how it's going to feel when you start running up that mountain and looking behind you and seeing all of Sonoma Valley and Petaluma and Rohnert Park, and Santa Rosa, and the mountains behind. And one time it was so beautiful, I woke up Mary at 3.30 in the morning and said, come on, honey, drive with me, you got to see this. And she's so sweet. She did. She didn't, of course, she was half asleep in the car. And she said, this is great, honey, take me home. But the point is this, I run because I love to. One more story. I used to teach at a number of colleges, and at one particular college, I was also the educational dean. So I would teach during the day and run the evening school at night, so I was gone from 8 in the morning until around 10 at night. And one day, one of my day students saw me leaving at 10 o'clock that night because he had come in to do some computer work, and he saw me. He said, Mr. Campbell, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I teach during the day, and I run the evening school. And he said, isn't that hard? 
the answer that I gave was absolutely automatic. Not when you love what you do. It's amazing what you can do when you love it. So let's go back to constructive. You know what, dear friends? I don't have to. I want to. I love what I'm becoming. I love what I am doing. And this is my idea. And you know what the brain says? Oh, okay. That sounds really neat. Let's work together. You know, I, I, the more I hear you in the various sessions, and it's just always a joy for us to uh, speak with you. Is, Thank you. Uh, and I have a question at the end of this, but I always, uh, well, take a close look at my shoulders, if you would. Uh, I'll give you a close up so you can. You see, okay. on, on one shoulder is a devil, uh -huh. and one shoulder is uh, the not devil, uh, the good guy. Uh -huh. And yeah. when I hear yeah. you yeah. speaking, okay, I'm always hearing your voice and that's your brain speaking. Yeah. And trying to pull you in two different directions. Now, having said yeah. that and been extremely charming and creative about that, my question to you is uh, circling back to uh, another fabulous session that uh, uh, we had with you, which is yeah. affirmations. How do you use affirmations to help guide yourself from... Uh, have to, or got to, to want to? Well, let me give you an example, because that's the best way to teach this. My, as I, I told you this story before, when my father died, he was very young, and Mary said to me, if you die early, I'll kill you. And so I said, okay, but I now is about 40 pounds more than I weigh now. So I said, okay, I need to lose this weight. So I would get up, and I would say, I have to lose this weight, because Mary would be really pissed off if I die, okay? I've got to lose this weight, I don't want to get diabetes and all these other things. And I struggled for 25 years. And I would lose maybe two or three pounds in a week, gain it all back in the weekend. Why? Because I was saying, you've got to. And the brain says, I hate that. I hate that. And after 25 years, I said, I realize, you know what, this isn't working. So I began using affirmations. An affirmation is nothing magical. It's simply a statement that I made to myself. So the affirmation I said was, oh, I weighed 200 pounds. At the point, I was 240 when I said that. I weighed 200 pounds. I look great, and I love running up my hill. And I love weighing less. And I love how I look. And the brain says, I do too. The problem is, Steve, you're not 200, you weigh 240. There's a 40 pound gap. Let's get rid of that gap and I'll help you do it. Rather than you're struggling to, let's do it together and let's watch the weight gradually come down. And imagine as you do your affirmations, how you're gonna feel when the scale says 200 and the shirt is loose on you and the genes that are so very tight are also loose. Those are affirmations. You lock onto those and you're doing it because you really like yourself. It really comes down to Art and John valuing who you are. Everything starts with that. Everything. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. I wanted to... I wanted to agree with you 100% about how amazing it is that you can accomplish things when you really love them. That you, yeah. you know, if you love it, it's not work. That classic yeah. Uh, yeah. line. Yeah. I've, over the years, I've met a, a number of people who have hobbies that have taken up most of their spare time. Mm -hmm. um, I think of guys in their garage rebuilding cars, rebuilding an old car or a tractor. I've known a lot of those guys. And they will spend every night after dinner, sometimes till midnight, mm 
Yeah. You know, yeah. sanding yeah. parts and painting yeah. parts and yeah. taking it apart and putting yeah. it back together and buying yeah. new parts. And, yeah. and same thing with model train people. That, those and are the two and hobbies that stick in my head. they're not even aware of the time. They're not yeah. aware of the time. Yeah. yeah. I used and to they, do model trains myself. If, if they had put that kind of energy into, I don't know what, running a business or something, yeah. they would have been hugely successful. But yeah. it's not. It's a, it's a hobby. Bingo, and they're successful yeah. in their mind. I'm in the process of doing of of doing a model of the Nautilus from 1954's version of Disney, Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, mm -hmm. and I love it, and I yeah. love it. My daughter bought it for me, and I'm just having a ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a wonderful lesson today. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. I, yeah. I I really look forward to these sessions. This is uh, this is so good to understand how we need to talk to ourselves. Yeah. Well, I'm excited because this is all brand new stuff. When I taught this in universities, people would say, why wasn't this taught 40 years ago or 50 years ago? And I would tell them, because we didn't know it. Yeah. 60 years ago, the brain was only what they autopsy. That's all they have. And now they have all this amazing technology that can watch the brain work while it's working. So you can just do myriad of studies and all of this stuff and all these books come out. And now with, with Google, it's just, it's just amazing what you, can, what you can learn. Psychology Today has got all of the articles they've ever written from day one right on Google. You just type in the title and there it is. It's amazing. Yeah. You can go to UC Berkeley and go to all the libraries. I mean, it's all, in, it's all there. It's all there. Well, I just want to reflect Good. that, Judge. Uh, uh, and uh, John, I don't know how you feel, but uh, we do a lot of stuff because we have to. But when we interview the brain whisperer, it's because we want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna we'll, we'll be back now. You hear? Okay. Thank you so much. For more on celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage. Follow us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube. And tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.